Have you ever found American chestnut in the grocery store? And have you ever eaten American chestnut? I bet you haven't, and here's why. The American chestnut used to inhabit most of our eastern United States forest, and many stakeholders utilize their resources in order to increase their quality of lives. They use the wood for buildings and furniture. They use their chestnut for food. However, in 1905, a fungus causing the disease chestnut blight was first introduced and detected in New York City Bronx Zoo. It was introduced from Asia. An infected nursery stock has been shipped to uh, the United States. And in Asia, local trees, local chestnut trees, do not show most, most uh, symptoms when infected with the disease because they have evolved resistance mechanism that protects them from uh, the fungus. But the American chestnuts, on the other hand, when they were first introduced with uh, the fungus, they were highly susceptible. And in less than 40 years, the entire forest were wiped out. So I wonder, what can we do as citizens and scientists to prevent yet another disease and another epidemic like the chestnut blight? Invasive species like the one I just mentioned can take many forms such as microorganisms, plants, insects. They affect many areas such as outdoors activities, people's home and yard, fishing, boating, agriculture, um, food supplies and animal and human health, many others. The Environmental Protection Agency has evaluated invasive species damages as high as $138 billion per year. So like I said, invasive species affect us in many ways. And here they are affecting our landscape. Bugsfoot blight was first detected in the early 2000s in North Carolina. It was thought to have been introduced from the UK and it's now spreading to Ohio and Virginia. Agricur agricultural crops. This picture on the left is showing an infected wheat head by uh, the fungus causing wheat blast. And once a field is infected, it rapidly spread through the field, causing terrible yield loss. So now that we have seen that, that invasive species can affect us in many ways, I want to bring up two aggravating factors that we are now facing. The first one being the global plant trade. And what I mean by the global plant trade is plant and plant products shipped throughout countries. And so, in this uh, map, you are looking at the geographical distribution of wheat blast, the disease that we have just talked about. And I highlighted in red are the countries that have confirmed wheat blast. So you can see that it was first spreading through uh, neighboring countries in South America. And in 2016, it made its way all the way to Bangladesh, causing terrible yield loss that year. On this map, you can also see different shades of brown. And those are indicating grain import from Brazil, with darker shade indicating greater import. So many countries are at risk of introducing the disease. Invasive species are a serious and global problem. And this is why um, they are also introducing a lot of uh, different in, uh, sp uh, a lot of different microbiomes because over a billion plants are grown in the U.S. each year. They start their life overseas. And with infected nursery and greenhouse stock or shipped local microbiomes capable of infecting our environment. The second aggravating factor that I want to uh, 
point two is climate change. As this map shows, global temperatures are rising, which means warmer winter and more humid winters. And in the context of invasive species, this means that previously inhospitable environment for pests are now becoming very favorable for the pests to thrive. To illustrate my point, this study has looked at three different beetles capable of infecting agricultural crops. On the left set of maps, you're looking at the current states in which the beetles is capable of uh, infecting agricultural crops. On the right set of maps, in red, you're looking at the expansion of uh, the very favorable environment in which the beetles would be capable of, of causing yield loss. So, it is a global issue, and that is why many global organizations have tried to organize the global plant trade in order to reduce incentives for countries to be the weakest link in the, in the chain and rely on the neighborhood and the neighbor's uh, invasive species management program. So, to cite a few, the WTO has trade related rules on uh, humans. Uh, humans, animal, plant related health and life. The Convention Biological Diversity has um, developed program in order to um, protect biodiversity from invasive alien species. And the International Plant Protection Convention is also aiming at protecting, protecting plants from uh, invasive alien pests. I believe scientists are bound by the social contract to find solutions to problems that most affect us. And I want today to challenge all scientists to participate to public debates and communicate your findings to, police, to policymakers in order to better shape policies for tomorrow. Your research on risk assessment Disease diagnostic tool, life cycle, just to cite a few, can help guide phytosanitary measures and protocols. All too often, phytosanitary lists are developed by individual government and reflect politics rather than strict risk assessment. Which means that sometimes little or no evidence, scientific evidence, support the, regula the regulation of the pest. In addition, successful invasive pest program require reliable funding and infrastructure to develop long-term research. So as scientists, we can act as an informed electorate to pressure politicians in order to make scientifically informed decisions rather than political ones. And whether a scientist or not, as citizens, I urge you to hold your representative accountable on issues that most affect us. I also urge you to make conscious choices when buying plants and plant products. Together, we can prevent future ghost forests to arise from devastating ep epidemics like the chestnut blight. Thank you for spreading the right choices.